Kanuit mihi, kanuiti aroha kia koto. I know it's not the done thing bringing a chair out, but I'm doing it. I know it's not the done thing bringing your notes out, but I will be speechless. I'm fearful I will be speechless if I don't bring some notes out. So, look, it is absolutely wonderful to be here with you tonight. I, I've been thinking so hard and long about this topic that, uh, you know, I, I thought the only thing that will work is being truly confessional about myself. I think confessions work. Clearly Wallace showed us that. <laughs> so, um, and I guess as a broadcaster, the thing is that Lots of people, and they were talking to me at work about this today. God, you must have some good stories about dead air. And I think, you know, like the night the auto cue died and you saved proceedings or the, <laughs> the time that, you know, you blanked during a live cross. Well, all of those things did happen. But let me tell you, I was not the saviour of the moment. The thing is that, you know, broadcasters are great at humble bragging about this sort of stuff. But... You know, it makes us sound like our lives are truly interesting and, and edgy. They're not. I just want you to know that. They're as mundane as anything. Um, and the trouble is, when I started going through uh, the things that have happened to me, uh, I realised how what an incredibly boring person I really am. I, I've got no great war stories. And this was, this was really confronting, to be honest. And I made the mistake last night of talking to my 15-year-old daughter. And I said to her, well, what would truly shock you about your mother? She turned with a jaundiced eye to me and said, if you had a porn star past. <laughs> I played with that for a while, let me tell you. <laughs> Carol Hirschfeld reveals her porn star past. <laughs> Carol Hirschfeld, a.k.a. Fluffy Ranfurly. <laughs> what she did in the shadows. <laughs> and I, I just say, Fluffy Ranfurly, that is, you know, if you, gener you do that silly game, I know you've all played it. Take your first pet, your first street, put them together, I'm Fluffy Ranfurly. <laughs> that is an absolute truth. Unfortunately, that confession, though, isn't. My, my true and dull confession, it's so tragically mundane, is I'm shy. It's true, I'm shy. I'm shy, not like my sister, who was of the, you know, sweat-inducing, um, hyperventilating uh, kind of shy. She was so shy, my beautiful sister, when uh, we were, uh, when I was flatting, she would come to my flat, bolt down, when I say bolt, I mean she would run, like you saying bolt, with diarrhoea, down my hallway to get to my room so she wouldn't have to talk to any of my flatmates. Now, unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, I, I wasn't that kind of shy. I was the absolute opposite. My, my social awkwardness bred in me a kind of strange verbosity, verbal diarrhoea, if you like, and... You know, I, I, I know many of you will remember Seinfeld. Okay, and do you remember the episode about the close talker? Well, think of me as the over-talker. I am the over-talker, the person who wants to fill the awkward space all the time to make everybody feel better. And unfortunately, it has been so awful down through the years. You know, and in fact, my friends, one of them accused me of a Carol log. This is another Carol log that we're having. Another friend, well, I thought they were a friend recently, said, uh, described it as Carol splaining. <laughs> I, thought, I thought there was kind of a nice modern twist on it, but really, you know, kind of upsetting at the same time. I, I suppose part of that over-talking has been about feeling that my self-appointed role was to make sure that everybody feels at ease, everybody relaxes. So in many ways, I'm the very opposite of dead air. And that great tendency, I suppose, you know, my, my husband recently was, was, he would describe my aimless, uh, aimless riffs as, well, he wouldn't even describe them. What he would do in public, he just turns me down like this. <laughs> do you know how embarrassing that is? <laughs> you know, I mean, he does make me feel like a screaming boy, and I probably am, and I'm going to blame it squarely on my dad. Now... I get a lot of things from my dad. I get my big feet, an extra bone in my rib cage, a kind of bloody mindedness, bloody mindedness. But sadly, his poor techniques as a raconteur, he has absolutely passed on to me. Um, 
Dad is a great one for starting conversations without any kind of preamble whatsoever. I don't know if your parents are like that any, at all. I mean, he's got this kind of presumption that somehow you have been thinking exactly <laughs> what he's been thinking at the very moment he's thinking it. So, you know, he, he, he's already begun that conversation in his head and is making a really random decision about how he's going to verbalise it. Sadly, as I get older, I can see I'm really going his way. I'll, I'll give you an example. On Sunday, I walked into his house, and he turns to me and says, apropos of nothing, you know, I don't think it's a crime if a man rings up a woman. <laughs> Dad, I'm with you on this one. No, he's 85, you know, I'll give him some leeway. I did, and, you know, I thought, wow, you know, I know we talked about that Viagra thing in your 70s, but I hope you haven't gone back, back to the dating thing. But it turns out that he had been following the news avidly of uh, Donald Trump and his historical attempt, apparently, to pick up Lucy Lawless, which was breaking news in the Herald over the, the weekend. <laughs> Um, so, you know, this, this is a sort of an idea of how, how conversation can go with my dad at times. But when, he was, when I was younger, I did actually think he was the greatest storyteller of all times because, you know, that's what you do with your dad. You hear them tell you stories, you believe them, and they teach you about the world. And so was the case, unfortunately, uh, when I heard the story, our legendary family story about great-granddad Hutton who was my father's granddad on uh, his mother's side. So great-granddad Hutton was legendary because he lived to 102. Um, and, you know, we're all hanging out there and hoping that our DNA is going to uh, hold, us, hold us well for the next few years. But Dad told this story, that, and family law goes that when granddad Hutton was a younger man, he had to go to hospital for a brain operation. And when the doctors opened up his skull... Um, to take out his brain. They popped it in a jar and they put it on the windowsill <laughs> and went and had a cup, of co a cup of tea, as you do, of course. So when they returned, to their dismay, they had discovered that the hospital cat had eaten his brain. <laughs> so one doctor turned to the other and said, OK, who does he work for? I've got to add, Dad's Australian, OK? The other doctor said, well, he's with the Victorian State Railway Authority. No problem, said Dr. One. We'll pop some cotton wool in and sew him up. He should be fine. And so Granddad Hutton went on to live uh, a long and happy life. So I heard that story probably first when I was four years old, and I thought, wow. <laughs> I gave that as a morning talk. I thought my family was pretty amazing. <laughs> then one day when I was about 10, I was listening to my dad talking uh, with one of his mates and there was lots of manly guffaws after the story was told and suddenly it dawned on me, isn't that story true? <laughs> no, darling, that story's not true. What were you thinking? I was speechless, I tell you. I was totally speechless. Now... Despite all of these clear difficulties in terms of genetics um, as, as uh, being somewhat a handicap in terms of storytelling, um, and despite being, you know, innately gullible and all of the rest, I did blunder into broadcasting. Actually, I was perfectly well made for it when I think about it. Um, and it led me all over the place, but eventually it did lead me to my very first co-presenting role on television. Many years ago, Crime Watch in the 1980s. <laughs> yes. Come on! You know you loved it. An hour-long program, no auto cue, um, and it involved walking and talking. Do you know how hard that is? That was really hard back in the day. Um, but my first night. Uh, I remember as, as being completely and utterly unforgettable. I was with the, the um, absolutely lovely uh, Ian Johnston, who was my co-host. And, um, you know, I invite you to please Google me, because I have. 
And because I wanted to remember, I want to start with the jacket. I was like the lost member of the Supremes. This is my, <laughs> this was my first big gig on television. And I went out and got the best looking jacket I possibly could. Hot pink, Adrian Winkelman tuxedo. I know, you should see the shoulder pads, honestly. It was a thing of beauty. So we, we were down in Avalon putting out this, it was quite a big show back in the day. Um, we rehearsed all day. Um, there were five cameras on, on the floor. We had a thousand policemen, they were answering phones, we were interviewing them. I was pretty excited. And I thought, okay, here's the big moment. I, I can't, can't wait to go. Sitting there beside a veteran like Ian, heard the music go down, the moment had come, Ian starts the show, he, after, actually just as we're going on air, it's funny, a lot of broadcasters do this, I won't tell you what John Campbell's little signature thing is, <laughs> he can tell you himself, but Ian, just before he would go on air, he'd just stroke the desk lightly and I thought, oh, it's really happening, we're going to go, we're going to go, we're going to be live on air in a minute. Anyway, he opens the show, good evening, welcome to Crime Watch, I'm Jean, uh, Ian Johnston, and then it was my turn to speak. And it was one of those moments where everything absolutely slows down, it, everything goes in slow motion, and I could see everything around me, and it's like you get hypervision, it's like you can see the whirls of dust in the air. <laughs> and I thought, it's my turn to speak. And I thought, I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I really can't remember what my line is. And then there was this little part of my brain that was saying, don't panic, you've got a hard copy script in front of you. And I thought, I'll just look at my script. I looked down at my script and I thought, oh shit, it's out of order. <laughs> and I can see that that is not my first line. And at that moment... Dead air. It was echoing around the studio, everywhere. And wonderfully, the fantastic Ian Johnson leans over, saves the day and says, and this is my lovely co-host, Carol Hirschfeld. Please welcome her. <laughs> and, and it's true, he is the most wonderful person, apart from you, darling, <laughs> to work with on air. And, but as a result of what happened that night, I've got to say, I never ever go on stage without writing my name. <laughs> because once you've actually forgotten your name, your own goddamn name, you never do it again. Thank you so much. <laughs>